Good night. The border battle is once again in the spotlight as the Prime Minister offers to work with state leaders to urgently resolve border restrictions so residents living in border communities can move freely across state boundaries to access healthcare and work. The movement bubbles a part of a deal being finalised by the New South Wales and Victorian governments. South Australia has announced tougher travel restrictions and tightening of coronavirus measures on Victorians in cross-border communities as of this Friday. Joining me now, Nationals MP for Mallee, Dr Anne Webster. Anne Webster, great to see you tonight as usual. Uh, so what's actually happening with this South Australian uh, imposition? Uh, I know that uh, you're very, very concerned. In fact, I think you used the term that this South Australian border ban will crush Victorian border communities. Yeah, look, I think, you know, we have a lot of talk uh, about flattening the curve, but these restrictions are flattening our communities. I noticed that um, the Minister, Opposition Minister for Health was just saying then about the mental health concerns and uh, the anxiety that people are feeling. And it's absolutely true all up and down the Victorian border. My office is inundated and I spent all weekend answering emails. Um, assuring people that I would fight on their behalf. I have taken every concern to the Prime Minister and uh, I know that he and his office are working on these things as well to assist, to try and get some common sense as opposed to what appears to be panic policy making. There is no justification, as I've said to you before, Gleeso, there is no justification for these draconian measures on the South Australian border to stop people from Friday from being able to go to work, from being able to get fuel, from being able to get medical supplies and groceries, stopping teachers going to work, stopping farmers going from one side of the border to the other side of the border when they've got um, cattle on both sides. Like, they're just extraordinary measures. And I think uh, this COVID crisis has split the country. I think it's divided the country. I think there's the city narrative and what's going on in the cities. And of course that's serious and it's real and it's happening. And then of course you've got um, the, the regional communities in the bush where you're not seeing near the amount of uh, COVID cases and yet they're adopting this one size fits all approach. And I, I think when we look back on what happens with this, you know, how we approach this and how we dealt with it, I think the bush and the regions are the ones that have come off second best. Oh, look, there is no question in my mind about that. The bush, um, as you call us quite right, in our regional communities, uh, not just our cross-border communities, but the whole of Mali, we have seven active cases, seven right now. And uh, yet we are seen, uh, we've been caught up in the narrative around COVID-19 in Melbourne, which I agree with you is very serious. We absolutely appropriate um, restrictions, lockdowns have occurred there. But our regional communities are also being imposed on with regulations and restrictions that are they're impossible to justify. I cannot justify them. There is no medical evidence that we are a raging COVID um, colony in the regions and uh, people's lives are not just put on hold, the consequences are extraordinary. I have one gentleman down in Caniva who has squamous cell carcinoma. He's had it for five years. He's had some terrible surgery. Um, my father died of this disease actually this year. So I'm very familiar with it. And uh, it's humiliating. Uh, he has a peg tube right now. He got an exemption this week to go across to see his doctor, normal doctor, and uh, the doctor was not allowed to have him in the surgery. The doctor had to come out to the car and provide a consultation in the car park. Adding to the humility, um, our regional Victorian people are seen as carriers of COVID when there is absolutely no justification for that. It really is, it's humiliating for everyone. And I hear terrible stories about people's cars being keyed, uh, run off the road. I had someone write to me about that today. It's just horrifying. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, uh, the fact that so many politicians are based in cities, I think there's a city-centric way of, uh, of looking at this and uh, I, I think it's going to go down as one of the real issues to emerge from this. And just quickly before we go, 
uh, only year 11 and 12 students are allowed to enter SA. Uh, yes, but not the teachers, interestingly. So I have one uh, farmer's wife who is a... Yeah, not teachers. So uh, I have one farmer's wife who is a specialist musician and uh, she teaches year 11 and 12. She wrote to me today and she said, I'm not allowed to go across. My year 11 and 12 students uh, will have to do the last 12 weeks on their own. As a musician myself, I understand, having taught year 12 music, I understand what that means. And that puts an enormous amount of stress on those students. Not only that, Peter, we have um, university students from Mildura, Tom Midgley and Tessa, and Christy from down south who were doing studies in Adelaide and the universities are not allowing them to continue. Christy had one four-hour preclinical trial to do, one four-hour preclinical trial to do to complete her nursing, to become a very, very needed member of our community right now. And yet she's not allowed. She applied three times for an exemption, refused. That's what I mean. Tessa, it's just crazy. That's what I mean. And, That's and what I mean. You know, these these are the hidden stories. These are the hidden stories yep. that you know Australians need to know about. I mean, that's crazy. Yep. And we're and on... keep up the good fight. Keep up the good Thank fight. You.